Oh, so good to see you all. Easter is my favorite Sunday of the year. It's the favorite Sunday for followers of Christ around the world. Our son Tad and his wife Diana and their daughter Addie are in Bali. And they sent us uh, photos of uh, the celebration of Easter there. I want to talk today about one of the biggest questions of life. What does it take to be made right with God? Uh, most of us wonder about this at some point, even if you're not a church person. If you're not sure you believe in God or what you think about Jesus, you've probably wondered, if there is a God, what does it take to be made right with him? As soon as someone dies, most of us think about this. Uh, my freshman year at Lewis and Clark College, the second semester, I had a roommate who was unhappy I talked uh, uh, with him a lot about it. We'd, we'd go to dinner together, and I worked in Young Life, and uh, I went away on a weekend retreat and uh, uh, got back late Sunday afternoon, and the police were in our room. I said, what's going on? They said, we're looking through Guy's stuff. Guy was his name and for some clues. I said, what's, what do you mean? They said, well, we found him dead in the bottom of Crown Point. I'm trying to figure out if it was you know, suicide or something else. I thought, my goodness, 48 hours ago he was fine. Now he's gone. And Lewis and Clark, there's a lot of skepticism about God and Christian faith, but suddenly lots of people began to talk about what happens after you die? Our daughter, Jamie, is a sophomore at uh, Portland State, and the uh, last two years she's served as a lifeguard uh, on Lake Michigan, and one of her fellow lifeguards, a guy named Josh, um, he uh, was, a was a swimmer, and uh, you can tell from uh, the photo, uh, Jamie, you know, got her muscles from me, obviously. <laughs> um, and he, after swim practice uh, one day, his heart was beating so fast that he collapsed on the locker room floor. And they rushed him to the hospital, but uh, he was dead on arrival. And people are saying, whoa, God, Josh, he was the healthiest, strongest guy I knew. What happened? And people began to comfort themselves with words like, at least Josh is in heaven. When someone dies, it doesn't matter what they believe, people start to say things like, he's gone on to a better place. They say something that sounds nice, like, grandma is in a better place looking down on us. Now, I don't know about you, but there are at least three times a day I don't want grandma looking down on me from anywhere. So what does it take to be made right with God? The point I want to make today is you can be made right with God. I'd like to suggest how. Teenager? Single person? Married? Empty nester? It all has to do with Jesus Christ. Every Easter we give people an opportunity to become followers of Jesus Christ. So I just want to let you know that I'll give you an opportunity at the end of the service. I'd like to talk about how we can be made right with God by talking about two guys in the New Testament book of John. The story goes back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. There was a group called Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees were very good people. They were the religious leaders. They did good to be made right with God. They hated Jesus because he didn't follow their rules. A couple of the Pharisees thought that Jesus just maybe might be from God. So they decided that one of them, a man named Nicodemus, would come and ask him. I mean, if Jesus came from God, maybe he could answer their question, how do we get made, get made right with God? This is John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So that means he's an important person. Everybody knows him in Jerusalem. 
He came to Jesus at night. Well, that tells us because he was a Pharisee, he didn't want other Pharisees to know that he had come to talk to Jesus. And he said, Rabbi, we know. From the word we, we realize that he's not just speaking for himself. He's representing at least two people, maybe more of the Pharisees. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus did a lot of miracles. He says nobody could do that unless he was from God. Because Jesus is God, he can read people's minds. So before Nicodemus asks his question, Jesus answers it. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. He asks the question Pharisees want to know. He, asks, he answers the question that everybody wants to know at some point. He answers the question that you're going to want to know at some point. How do we get right with God? How do I know that when I die, I'll go to be with God? Is there any way to know with assurance in this life about where I stand with God? Jesus says the only way is to be born again. Nicodemus is thinking, what? How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Dogs have dogs, cats have cats, people have people. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Nicodemus is singing, that's the first thing you've said that I get. But the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Because God is Spirit, if there's going to be a birth into God's kingdom, the Spirit has to be involved. There has to be spiritual power. It has to be a spiritual birth. Next week I'm going to begin a series called Have You Seen the Supernatural Power of God Lately? And we're making a little 8 to 10 minute video each week for the leaders of our community groups uh, to, to show in their community group. And if you'd like to be part of that, you'd like to gather a group, maybe some friends at work or school or your family, uh, uh, you can uh, watch along too. Uh, do you have a little clip on that uh, you can show, Cody? Have you experienced miracles in your life? When Jesus came to earth, he performed a lot of miracles. After he was raised from the dead, the apostles did a lot of miracles. In the Old Testament, we read that the prophets did miracles, particularly Elijah and Elisha. Can we do miracles today? You may wonder, well, why don't we see many miracles today? What's happened? Are we supposed to? Can we? I believe so. Jesus said, after he'd performed many miracles, Truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to my Father. Jesus says, when I go to my Father, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and you're going to have the Holy Spirit with you, so you can do these same miracles I do. So we'll start that series for about five weeks, uh, starting uh, next week. Talk about spiritual power and rebirth was totally new for Nicodemus. Because his view uh, of God was that God is up there saying, no, you did that wrong. No, nope, no, nope, you messed that one up too. Oh, that was okay. I'll give you extra points for that. It's the picture of God up there looking at uh, the good things we do, the bad things we do, and deciding if we do more good than bad, that maybe we'll be, may, may be right with him. Jesus says, no, Nicodemus, you've got it wrong. Just as you are the son of your physical parents, you can be born into God's family. Just as you were born to your parents, there is an internal 
spiritual birth that connects you to God. There must be an internal, not external behavior, but an internal spiritual birth. So the first thing I want to say in answer to the question, what does it take to be made right with God is you have to be born spiritually. You have to be born again spiritually. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. He's thinking, how could have I missed this? How could have I spent my whole life trying to please God, trying to uh, be as good as I can? And you're telling me there's something beyond that. You're telling me that just as I was born to my parents, I can have a spiritual birth into God's kingdom. Jesus continues, no one has ever gone into heaven. Nicodemus is thinking, that's right, that's the problem. We're trying to figure out how do we get to heaven. I mean, nobody's ever gone to heaven and come back and say, okay, here's what you have to do. So we're always wondering. We never know for sure. Sometimes we feel close to God. Sometimes we, we feel far from God. Sometimes we feel forgiven by God. Sometimes we feel condemned by God. We're back and forth. So we were hoping you could explain it to us. Jesus goes on, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake. Well, Nicodemus who knew who Moses was. He was the one who led the Hebrew people out of Egypt. He was the one who received the Ten Commandments from God. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Nicodemus knew that when Moses led the people out of Egypt to the Promised Land, they came through the desert, and one night they camped there in a place that was infested by snakes. And these were poisonous snakes, so people were getting bit, and they were getting very sick. And so they woke up Moses, and Moses said to God, what are we supposed to do? And God told him to do something very strange. He said, erect a large pole and put on it a bronze snake. And anybody who looks at it will be healed of their snake bite. Very odd. But when you're desperate, you're willing to do something odd, right? It's like, well, what do we have to lose? So people looked at the snake, the bronze snake, and they were healed of their snake bites. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus says, Nicodemus, you asked how I can be made right with God. How can I know for sure that I'm connected to God? Here's your answer. So Nicodemus goes back and tries to explain to his friend or group what Jesus said. He and his friend continue to believe in Jesus, but they do it secretly because they're afraid of the other Pharisees. Jesus gets more and more popular, and the Pharisees get more and more angry. Then Jesus raises a man from the dead named Lazarus. This is the final straw. John tells us many people believed in Jesus after that. So many that the Pharisees began to worry they were going to lose all their followers. They said, we've got to do something. So they arrested Jesus. They figured out a way to turn the people against Jesus. And they nailed Jesus to the cross. Nicodemus and his friend watch as they hoist Jesus on the cross. That's when it dawns on Nicodemus. This is what Jesus meant. This is what he predicted. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Not that everyone who behaves will get right with God, but everyone who believes this is the second thing I want to say in answer to the question, what does it take to get right with God? You have to believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. This is when it clicked for Nicodemus and his friend. 
Just as Moses lifted up the snake so the people could be healed from their snake bites, Jesus was lifted up on the cross so we could be forgiven of our sins. So that if we believe in him, we can have eternal life. That's when they realized that Jesus was sent from God to be the Savior of the world. They believe that Jesus died taking the penalty for sin so we could be forgiven and be made right with God. Aaron Feist was a 37-year-old football coach at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. When Nicholas Cruz op opened up his AR-15 semi-automatic rifle and started shooting students, uh, the natural reaction is to protect yourself by taking cover. But students reported that Aaron Feist ran in the direction of the uh, gunshots. He threw himself in front of students to protect them from the bullets. Students say that's always the way he was. He was a coach that cared about his football players and he would, players that are injured, he would pray for them, he'd share Bible verses with them. He took a bullet for the students. That's what Jesus did. We sinned against God. A holy God insists that there must be a penalty paid for sin. Jesus, God's only son, came to this world. He never sinned, so he never deserved to die. But he made himself the target to take the bullet for us. When Jesus gave his last breath, Nicodemus and his friend, Joseph of Arimathea, decide that they're done keeping their belief in Jesus secret. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Now they're out in the open about their faith. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. They wash Jesus' body. Then they wrap it with spices so that when the body decays, it won't... There won't be an immediate stench of death. They cover his head. By the time they're done, there's an additional 100 pounds of weight on his body. If someone wasn't dead before, they'll be dead after this process because the linen covers the head and face. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. They buried him with no hope of ever seeing him alive again. Because they buried Jesus, two days later, people in Jerusalem knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus had been killed and buried and was raised again to life. If they had not wrapped his body with the linens, here's what probably would have happened. The Romans would typically take criminals down from a cross and they'd throw them in a valley outside Jerusalem called the Valley of Gehenna. If Jesus had risen from the ashes of Gehenna and walked into Jerusalem with bug bites and smelling like trash, it would have been remarkable. But it would have been explainable. He clearly hadn't been dead. They would have reasoned. But the act of wrapping Jesus' body in spices and linens around his head and placing him in Joseph's tomb provided irrefutable proof that Jesus had, in fact, risen. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea believed that Jesus was lifted up on the cross for the sins of the world and was raised from the dead, proving once and for all that he is the Son of God. Somebody asked Pastor Warren Wiersbe, our pastor said that Jesus swooned on the cross 
and his disciples nurtured him back to life, what do you think? He says, well, beat your pastor with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes. <coughs> then nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for three hours. Then push a spear through his heart. Then embalm him with linens tightly and then put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens to him. I mean, there's no doubt about it that Jesus was dead. He died and then was raised from the dead. This is what we need to believe to be made right with God. I proclaim to you today not a dead Christ, but a living Savior. He's not dead, he's alive and here with us. The third thing I want to say in response to the question, what does it take to be made right with God, is you have to declare your faith in Jesus. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea decided that they were no longer going to believe in secret, but they're going to go public with their faith in Christ. You may be thinking, faith is not a very popular thing at my school, or my place of work, or here in Portland. I'm not going to embarrass myself by telling people I have put my faith in Jesus. I'll keep it a private thing. Imagine if when I got engaged to my wife, Jory, I'd said to her, I'll commit to you, but let's just keep it a, a private deal. Just between you and me. I don't want to have a ceremony uh, that's public where everybody's going to see and I have to put a ring on to show that I'm married to you. That would be embarrassing. If I'd said that, there would be nine fewer children in the world today. <laughs> Jesus said, but whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. In order to be made right with God, Jesus calls us to publicly confess before others that we put our faith in Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to declare your faith in Jesus. If while I've been speaking, there's something rising up in you that says, I get it. I see it. I become right with God, not by living a good life, not by trying to live a good life, but by being reborn spiritually and believing that Jesus was raised from the dead and is the Son of God. If you feel your heart pounding, that's the Holy Spirit working within you to help you be born and come alive spiritually. Or possibly you've been coming to church for a while, but today you say, I get it. That it's not how well you behave that makes you right with God, but it's believing that you can't be good enough to earn your way to heaven. You have to put your faith in Jesus who died in your place. And you'd like to mark this Easter as the day you got right with God. Or maybe when you were like eight years old, your parents said to you, do you want to burn in hell forever or do you want to come to heaven with us? You say, I'll, I'll go to heaven with you. <laughs> but years passed since then. Nothing has happened. No fruit in your life, no desire. Maybe today you want to say, Jesus, I want to recommit to you. I'm back. I believe you are the Savior of the world. Or maybe you've put your faith in Christ, but you realize that you've slid back into thinking that being right with God all depends on how well you do, how perfect you are. And you want to thank God today that being right with him depends not on you behaving what you do, but believing what Jesus did. And you realize that you can be certain that you can be made right with God. So, as I close in prayer, I want to give you an opportunity to get right with God. Let's all bow our heads. And I want to invite you, if you'd like to say, you know...
I'd like to get right with God, you can just pray with me, kind of repeat after me silently, and I invite every one of you here to do the same. Maybe you know you've committed your life to Christ before, but restating it is always a good thing. So you just pray with me. Dear God, thank you that I'm here on Easter. I believe that you are real, that there is a God, and I admit that I have done things wrong. I've made mistakes with my life, and I want you to forgive me. And I'm convinced that Jesus is your son, that he died on the cross, and that you raised him from the dead, showing him to be the son of God. And I want him in my life, so I invite him right now to be head of my life. Come into my life and transform me like Jane Marshall that we saw in the video. Make me a new person. I'm not trusting my behavior. I'm not trusting my attempts to be good. I'm trusting in you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.